All right. Thanks for taking a seat. So we're going to start the last session of the day, and we'll finish with uh, public education and communication. So, hello, can you take a seat, please? So the first speaker is uh, Victoria Friedensen, who's going to uh, present the work by Melissa, I cannot pronounce it, uh, Weinstroer? Wayne Stroer. Wayne Stroer. So um, um, Melissa is a, a public affairs specialist at FEMA, and uh, the talk is about the uh, exercise, the communication outcomes from the 2016 Asteroid Impact exercise. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Sorry, I am um, trying to figure something out here. Um, Hi, so no, my name's not Melissa, I'm Victoria Friedensen. Um, Melissa Wainstrower came to spend six months with the Planetary Defense Coordination Office. She's uh, uh, at FEMA in Philadelphia and what came to us as through the Presidential Management Fellow Program. Uh, it was an enormously exciting time um, for us at NASA uh, when she got there and she was a tremendous contributor. I have to figure something out just real quick here. All right, that's the one I want, right? Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is the outcomes of the tabletop three exercise that NASA and FEMA held in October of 2016. It will inform a lot of the discussions that the communications subgroup has had during this uh, exercise scenario, as well as some of the other discussions that have been going on in the conference. Uh, the Tabletop 3 exercise was held to inform emergency response officials on the unique and challenging as aspects of an asteroid impact and to determine whether and how existing federal interagency operational plans, in other words, how the government normally conducts business during an emergency, and annexes might apply to this type of disaster. So, for example, uh, FEMA has these federal interagency operations plans for nuclear or radiological incidents. Would those plans be suitable to, as a suitable basis for a response to an asteroid impact? That's a, a pretty critical question because those plans do take some investment. One of the recommendations out of Tabletop 3 was to host an exercise just for public affairs staff from NASA and FEMA to discuss the myriad communication issues that would arise from a predicted impact event. And the, the attendees were senior public affairs outreach and communications representatives from both agencies, as well as the Planetary Defense Coordination Office. You all heard about the scenario from Paul Chodas earlier today, so I won't talk about the scenario in and of itself. Um, but in a real world event, press releases and related information would likely be made available whenever new observations would allow, which would be much more frequently than presented during the, uh, during the exercise. It illustrates that too long a gap in useful information can start generating um, spin in such a way that then you have to recover from that when you're ready to talk again. Inject one, for for the exercise identified a large um, um, uncertainty region or a gap in plans that I want the space agencies and emergency management agencies around the world would have to respond to. They would be releasing their own updates and guidance and it would be imperative that uh, NASA and FEMA stay apprised of and at best coordinate the relative messaging, and is what we say, we need to be um, concise and consistent. All the uh, agencies involved would need to be talking the same messages. The Damien uh, Interagency Working Group I talked about earlier, uh, National Strategy, will define roles for a U.S. federal response to a predicted asteroid impact. 
The amount of notice for the impact makes the scenario unique from other national, natural disasters, and it raises a lot of different questions. The public also will likely demand updates and evidence of preparation from both FEMA and NASA from the moment the asteroid is discovered, and would not feel at all comfortable to hear that FEMA is relying on an existing strategy rather than creating a new plan for the event. At Inject 2, it could be land or water at this point. In one year, the risk corridor was reduced from crossing the continental U.S. to specifically the L.A. Basin. The government, and certainly most of the governors in other states, may feel they are out of the woods. That doesn't uh, help the governor of California at this point in the scenario. Conspiracy theories and inaccurate information will spread from the moment the asteroid is discovered. We've been talking about this. But it will probably be especially bad when the asteroid is unobservable and there is no cr new credible information to share. In a real world event, there is a period of unobservability and be prepared to maintain a media presence to help counteract that. The risk corridor predicted impact region maps required a lot of explanation. All those red dots just are not, in, not easily ex understood by folks. People were interpreting these, and the pe when I say people, I mean state, local, and regional emergency operations professionals, okay, had trouble interpreting those dots. So for the scenario in Jack 3, things are getting worse. Um, we're expecting major disruptions, all kinds of things. And the discussion was on the economic and social flight from the predicted impact area would be a major source of concern. And the stakeholders, as well as governments, would likely ask any official for their comment. But it's really critical that unless you're responsible for a specific area of the response to let that uh, organization do the answering. In other words, NASA would not answer for FEMA, and FEMA would not answer for NASA. The effects to critical infrastructure in this scenario would be on a, schedule, a scale that we have not dealt with before in a real world situation. So emergency response agencies would need to be prepared for the types and amount of questions and support requested from that sector. And it's vitally important that evacuation orders are communicated as early and as with much information as possible. I also submit that it is possible to even engage the public and local communities in developing those local and regional emergency evacuation plans. Many of the more complicated issues that would arise in this scenario, such as the right to return, insurance, et cetera, would need to be addressed through new law and policy. And it would be important to empower local decision making in the event of a predicted impact. Now in the United States, there's the Stafford Act, which gives power to FEMA in the event of an emergency. But FEMA cannot declare an emergency. It's governors of individual states that declare emergencies. And FEMA can't go in and do anything until the, government sa the governor of that particular state says, uh, ask for the help. So this is um, a different tweak, and whether that would change under this kind of an emergency uh, as yet to be known. FEMA's unofficial motto is, all disasters are local. Disaster response starts and ends at the local level, and most local officials and agencies would be the people in the front line responding to their communities. So to share and integrate processes in this type of a thing, you'd expect that NASA and FEMA, certainly in the early parts, uh, portions of the disaster, of the emergency preparation would be talking very closely. If a new plan is created, consider how response personnel, including partners, stakeholders at the state and local level, would need to be involved. FEMA. The FEMA folk asked a lot of questions on how PDCO informs national leadership as well as NASA leadership of a threat and how long the process takes and what stakeholders, including the White House, would be informed. And by talking through this process, then they were able to contribute, uh, bring input back to us. How the governors of the potentially impacted states would be, in how would they be informed? 
would it go to the White House and then out to the states, or would they all be concurrently be informed? This is a FEMA decision. And in FEMA, there's a specific emergency support function, which is public affairs, outreach, and communication that would be actively engaged through social media, through the internet, as well as through more traditional communication venues of television and news engagement. Uh, using uh, FEMA has a much different approach to social media than NASA does. We use a lot of cool science at NASA, and we use Twitter very effectively, for example, to talk about new events, new discoveries, etc. FEMA uses it to say, go down to your local emergency management office at this designated point to pick up your applications. So it's a very different approach for them to deal with these things. Joint messaging. Stakeholders will ask questions of FEMA and NASA without caring who's actually responsible for, what, uh, for, for whatever the answer is. These agencies need to understand where, what is happening and where so they can help direct but not answer for. How would NASA and FEMA address sources outside of their own agencies for sharing information and offering commentary? How would we place a predicted impact in the context for a non-scientific public? How would FEMA communicate messaging at its customary eighth grade reading level or below? The public should be made aware of the timelines of NASA and FEMA preparations and decision milestones to reduce speculation and alleviate any concern that not enough work is being done and to ensure that the accurate and timely message is being getting out. We know that we'll be swimming upstream from fake media, from uh, unauthorized sources, but we believe that by being consistent, clear and concise, and becoming the trusted information source, that both NASA and FEMA will be able to, uh, over time, be able to manage the information flows. Ethics and building trust. It's e got to start soon and before the event, and what and it needs to <coughs> sorry address public debate over emergency preparations and response. And this is especially on the FEMA side. What are the ethical considerations of a deflection mission? When, why, what form, and how much do we spend on a deflection mission will actually be likely subject to congressional and public debate and the cost relative to um, the emergency response after an event would likely be discussed. And we would be mindful that some people will not consider the decision from a, what we may think of as a rational scientific perspective. Challenges include questions. Why were you not able to detect the asteroids sooner? Why can't you launch a deflection mission? That was from a very senior member of the California uh, Board of Emergency Operations. What, you don't have a spare rocket? Um, and I don't mean to belittle, I mean that's not it at all. It's, it's how we're working with perception. Why wasn't more money devoted to planetary defense? That's a question we got. And why wasn't FEMA or other emergency management agencies more prepared to respond? So in a way we'll be reactive even as we're being proactive in our communications. Actions to take now, we can brief stakeholders. Uh, we can keep planetary defense in the public eye. And more importantly, we can develop a series of materials that both NASA and FEMA have on the shelf, as it were, that we can then pull out and use to communicate with the public. What is an asteroid? What does near Earth mean? What does Delta V mean? How is it you have to do what? Okay, and work through these questions. If we can work together, our both public affairs groups work together, then we can build these products and they'll be available when the uh, when an incident should arrive and I think that's all for my time so thank you thanks a lot Victoria questions questions anybody I couldn't answer any FEMA policy questions anyway so thank you thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks Victoria So the next talk is uh, application of machine learning for planetary defense. Three cases are going to be presented. It's a work by uh, James Parr from uh, uh, NASA Frontier Development Lab. And the talk will be given by uh, Frank Marcus from SETI. Good afternoon. Let me just set up this. Wow. 
to PC, and I managed to do that. I'm proud of myself already. Okay, so obviously I'm not James Parr. I'm Frank Marchis. I'm a City Institute researcher. Uh, James could not come, so I'm gonna give the talk on his behalf. Uh, James is the founder of the FDL, so any criticism, any praises should be sent to him directly. Uh, I can relay the message, of course. I would like to thank as well, uh, as well uh, my colleagues here listed, Michael Bush, who is here, uh, Peter Jenninsken, uh, JL Galash and Eric Dahlstrom, who contributed to this project by being mentors of our uh, program. So a revolution is happening right now in the Silicon Valley. Everybody is talking about it. We call it machine learning, artificial intelligence. It's been used, it's a technology, an emerging technology which is being used to, uh, for a various range of application, uh, detect uh, you plate number when you cross illegally a bridge, um, um, as well as sell you uh, product or gadget or using uh, uh, your uh, behavior on computers. But machine learning at artificial intelligence can also be used for, to solve complex um, technological problems. So we, uh, in partnership with NASA, NASA was aware of this pot potential, so in, partner in partnership with NASA, uh, we created the, the FDL program to answer to, to this question, specifically focusing on the planetary defense program. So this started last summer with 12 participants, which has been hired by the FDL program. The goal of the program is to close the knowledge between, gaps between, um, uh, by matching the academic world with private industry and solving uh, complex problems related to planetary sciences and uh, with contribution from machine learning. So I use a lot machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence terms without really knowing what it is about. So I'm gonna show you here, the diagram here basically summarizes this very well. So this is artificial, artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, which is in fact composed of various uh, method. One of them is the Bayesian me method. Machine learning is a, a, a more recent one, which consists in training a computer to become smarter by learning from a large amount of data. Deep learning is the heart of uh, artificial intelligence right now. It's a more complex subfield of machine learning. In this case, the computer not only solves the problem, but also understands and finds the rules hidden behind the data. So it's slightly more ad advanced. So the objective of our FDL program, which is a, a basic, uh, um, a basic re uh, research incubator, is to uh, develop tools that could be used for planetary defense using machine learning, but also to show the potential of interdisciplinary approach between the industry and, the, and academia. So we started this project at the time where the asteroid grand challenge was, uh, was in place by the previous administration. Which, which goal was to find all asteroid threats to human populations and know what to do about them. So I'm pressing the, the core here. You all know that to successfully, successfully de deflect an asteroid, you need to know in advance a few parameters, which are what the asteroid is made of, what's the shape, and of course, what the base source of technology you will use to deflect it. So we architectured the program based on these three main questions, and I'm gonna show you three science cases based on, on, from this summer program. So first, what is the asteroid is made of? This part was led by Peter Jenninsken, who pointed out that only 31 meteorites uh, ever found have been linked to their source, meaning that we know, the, we, we know where these meteorites come from in terms of the asteroid, considering the orbit, the trajectory of the, of the, of the meteor, and after, after having retrieved retrieve the, the meteorite. It's interesting to retrieve a, a meteorite quickly because that gives you direct information on the composition of the, of the asteroid, which is the source of a meteorite, which, and if you do it quickly, you basically, um, uh, you basically make sure that you, your meteorite is not altered by the, by the weather on our planet. So this is a kind of a, a, a cheap way to find a sample of an asteroid with a sending a million dollar or billion dollar space mission. And fortunately, it's very difficult to find pieces of, uh, pieces of uh, fragments of meteorites on the ground. And this team has been working on the, on the, on the, on the system, which, which is based on the drone. They call that Meteor Rapid Response Drone. So 
To develop this method, first you have to train the algorithm. There is not that many pictures of uh, meteorite found on the ground. So they have to go, they went through the, the, the web, go retrieve all pictures known so far, develop their own pictures to train an algorithm by inserting these 25,000 pictures into a library of 15 million images. They use various algorithm, various uh, deep learning models. I'm not gonna give you the details here because I don't, I'm not really fully aware of them. Uh, three from Google and two, which is AlexNet, which is a G, um, NVIDIA system. And they also use a combination of those, of those algorithms. Those are pictures that they develop where basically they change the brightness, the composition, the orientation, sorry, um, the saturation of the picture to train the algorithm. So they use this algorithm with a, a 3DR uh, drone. You can see the shadow here. And, um, and a, a simple GoPro camera. And they tested this algorithm and they found a validation accuracy of 99.9% .9 on, on the computer. So then they tested this system on site. So they went to a specific field in California where Peter Jeninsken calculated uh, where Peter Jeninsken calculated that it could be the impact, the area of an impact of a recent meteor. And they, um, they, they run, they run the, uh, the, meteor, the, the drone on this field and uh, run the algorithm. So what you can see here is a picture of, uh, of the field, which is made of a high gra uh, dry grass. They set up two meteorites here themselves. Okay? They had them in the field. That's why we have a flag here to make sure they can ret recover them later on. And they run, the they run the drone and they run the algorithm. So this is not made on board yet. It's made a posteriori using a, high, uh, a highly efficient computer. But what is very interesting is that this algorithm, in fact, did ret retrieve two meteorites. It also retrieved two patches which are incorrectly labeled as meteorite. But that's quite a successful uh, algorithm considering that we have a field of, a field of 16,000 boxes here. So that's the first demonstration of the potential of, uh, of uh, deep learning to retrieve um, meteorite. So the second part is the, the determination of the shape of an asteroid. So we all know, we have talks on Tuesday about this, so you all know the importance of determining the shape of an, aster of an asteroid using radar observation, for instance, because the shape is critical for the deflection techniques as well as critical to understand the damage that could have the, the asteroid have, uh, during the impact. Uh, unfortunately, the determination of the, of the shape of an asteroid is quite uh, time-consuming when it's made by human being on the, in this case, uh, a student from uh, the student high by Michael Bush, which worked over the summer, it took four weeks for the students to go from this radar observation to the shape modeling here. So the goal of the team was to, auto to create an algorithm to do this automatically. So they have two, uh, two steps. First, of, first step was to, estim to det determine the, the spin axis, the, the axis of rotation of the asteroid using Bayesian optimization. And the second step is to use deep degenerating modeling to, to retrieve the, the, the shape. So I'm not going to go through all the details here, but um, they successfully applied the Bayesian optimization, and in four to six hours of computer time, derived the, the spin of, uh, of uh, various asteroids and compared this with what was determined by a human being. So it's a factor of 10 in gain of time here. Uh, to do this uh, shape reconstruction, they have to once again uh, train the algorithm onto the real data. So they created half a million synthetic radar observations using DAMIT and JPL that, uh, shape modeling of 1,620 models. And then they run this uh, deep, de deep generative uh, algorithm to retrieve the shape. So this is a work in progress, but the first result has been obtained a few days before the end of the, of the, of the program. And you can see here the output of the shape from the case of 1982 SK, and this is the real shape derived by, from a human, by a human being. This will be, of course, improved, and um, Michael is going to work with a team on the summer to, to use the same algorithm, inc increase the, the quality of the, data uh, of the data reconstruction to have a shape more accurate and test it to validate its efficiency. Okay, the last, how much time do I have? Oh, two minutes. Okay, the last, um, the, the third one, the third program was to, uh, to determine the, the best mitigation approach, uh, technology, sorry, 
based on the current knowledge of the, asteroid, of the NEA population. So we have a poster describing this in detail, so I'm not going to go through uh, all, uh, all the details here. Uh, Adam Greenberg, who must be here, is leading this effort, is here, so please ask him question directly. Um, the team first, um, to, to train the algorithm, the team basically created a, a set of uh, 1.5 million orbits. Uh, Ed, Ed gave a very interesting talk on, this, on the technique, and it's very similar to what they did. So they basically modified the orbit of non uh, NEAs, such as they basically impact our planet. Um, and then they, they studied uh, the effect of deflection using three uh, technology, um, atomic deflection device, <laughs> Uh, the kinetic impactor and gravity, tra gravity tractor using the most realistic as possible uh, char characteristic of the asteroid. And they derived the efficiency of these techniques on the large sample of, um, of um, asteroid orbit. So this is the result of, this, of, this, of their work for nuclear impactor, kinetic impactor, and gravity tractor. So you, can, you, you find here what we already knew. knew uh, the, uh, the, if we have a very short lead time, the nuclear impactor, of course, is the most efficient technique. Uh, kinetic impactor is efficient, uh, it, and it's efficient only if the asteroid has a small, relatively small size, etc. Please check the, the poster to know more about this. They trained the algorithm on this set of data, and they, um, and they, they derived the best. They, they derived this diagram that basically gives you the relative success per um, the mitigation technique. So obviously, what, what we knew is very fine here. Nuclear, de nuclear devices as, is the most efficient uh, mitigation technique. It's followed by kinetic impactor and gravity tractor. This is a work in progress. We want to improve this model. And I encourage you to contact Adam. And uh, such as you can in include new mitigation approaches. I've seen some of them already described Monday and Tuesday. But also, we want to include more realistic launch capability, included, for instance, the time travel, which is not taking into account here. OK, I'm going to finish, since I'm short on time, by saying that we are running FDL 2.0 this summer, and the application deadline is tomorrow. So if you have uh, an interest yourself to work with uh, planetary uh, uh, data scientists on pro specific problems related to planetary science, please apply or encourage you postdocs or you uh, colleagues to apply to this work. Um, I would like to say also that we're expanding this, uh, this program to, uh, data mi uh, to mining of asteroids. Um, someone mentioned yesterday that um, there is a, c a clear correlation of uh, work between the uh, mining of asteroids and planetary defense. We already thought about that and that's why we have this, uh, we included now that uh, mining of asteroids into our uh, uh, 2.0 uh, program. And I would like to finish thanking our partners, NVIDIA. We, it was very tough for some of our participants to let go this um, fantastic computer, and also our private partners, CETI, NVIDIA, and Autodesk, and of course, the 2016 FDL team. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Any questions or comments? There's one here. Very interesting research. Um, so for the deep learning part, how do you select the training data sets? Between data can... sets? Yeah, the training data sets. So we don't, in fact. Uh, we use 85% of the data set is used to train the system, and then the rest is used to do the analysis. Okay, so the training data sets is not yeah. verified either. Okay. Thanks a lot. Oh, up there. Uh, thanks. A couple of questions for you really quickly. First, um, most or many of the machine learning techniques currently available to us are black boxes, so you don't actually get to explore the algorithm directly uh, that it's using to make its decision. Uh, I know that um, if I make a decision and refuse to give justification for my recommendations for uh, a selection of deflection technique, that's not going to fly with Congress. So first is how do you determine the algorithmic process that comes out of your deflector to, uh, selector? And second is um, 
it's a moving target uh, as to what we understand the capabilities of each deflection method to be, and new methods are coming online at every PDC. So how do you uh, control for change in your priors for that system? Well, OK, so the first question is interesting. And I, I'm, I'm thinking about that often. In fact, I'm not like a data scientist. But we are seeing that more um, human and machine are partnering right now to provide provide answers to complex problems. Planetary defense is indeed a complex problem. Um, I don't have an answer for you, but I think it's going to happen slowly that we are going to integrate the machine to work with us to understand, to, to provide an answer. I can, as a world leader, you will have uh, scientists working with you, providing you data, and, but this data will come, and these responses will come from machine, and they will be working together, and it will be a natural process for you to, uh, to, to uh, understand, to accept this answer because it will not be coming from one person, it will be coming from a large community of algorithm plus human being. So I don't have an answer, but that's the way I see the future. Uh, about the second, second question, I think Adam should answer to that, but I'm sure you want to talk to uh, late, offline later because we, show, we, we don't have much time. Adam is here, we'll answer to your question. Okay? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. So we move to, the, I think there's another question, but we'll, no, I think we, we need to move on. So Daniel, I think you can ask uh, offline. Thanks a lot. Well, Bruce Betts, so the next talk is by Bruce Betts from the Planetary Society, and it's uh, public communication using five steps to prevent asteroid uh, impact. Good afternoon. Uh, today I'm going to present a public communication strategy, so a way to bundle information about that we've been talking about all week uh, to communicate it easily and clearly to the public, uh, that, and then I'll give some examples of how we're doing that at the Planetary Society. So the ideal public defense, uh, <laughs> public defense, planetary defense uh, public communication strategy would be clear unlike what I just was, and succinct and memorable. Our recommended strategy is to organize the information into a small number of steps or points. So this is something that's been used by governments and communicators and all sorts of people, a five-step plan, a three-point plan, a 12-step program. Uh, it's often uh, used by these because it's a way to organize the structure. And what's great is it's also scalable. So you, you can use this for a one-minute movie or a one-hour public talk, use the same organizational structure and change the amount of information under each of the topics. So the Planetary Society's example is a five-step plan to prevent asteroid impact. Um, these are not unique topics. In fact, the topics I'll show you are similar to the session titles that we've used this week. It's the bundling into a number of steps and using that for organization that we're proposing here. Uh, one could break it into a different number. We chose five, but it could be four, it could be three, it could be six. Uh, assume that the first part, so assume that the first part of things before the five-step plan is a general introduction to what are asteroids, why do we care, historical impacts, and then you uh, present five steps to prevent asteroid impact. First, find, so you can't uh, defend yourself if you don't know what's out there. Track, doesn't help you if you don't know if it's going to hit Earth. Characterize, got to know what uh, the population and what the asteroids, what their properties are, so you can figure out how to deflect or disrupt. Uh, what do you do when one's actually coming? And then internationally coordinate and educate. So this is something that particularly we at the conference see in a very real way every day here is that we need to coordinate across international boundaries, but making that point of why that's true is an important aspect of this, as well as conveying the importance of educating internationally about the asteroid threat, what it is, what it's not, and that it's preventable. The Planetary Society has begun using this type of communication strategy, for example, in blogs and on the web. So that's where we introduced this. 
downloadable infographics. So we've got this one on the uh, five-step plan. There's a analogous one that introduces the asteroid threat, historical impacts, and the like. You can find those at planetary.org slash defense. And then video. I'm excited to announce we're creating a series of six videos to introduce planetary defense and the asteroid threat. One with the introduction, what are asteroids, historical impacts, why do we care, and then one for each of the five steps we've outlined for preventing asteroid impact. Each is about two minutes long. Uh, we'll release the, all of them towards the end of June around asteroid day this year. Uh, and we've done them in a format of our uh, special episodes of our pre-existing video series, Random Space Fact, which includes space facts and a little bit of humor. So, I'm gonna, you're going to get to see the world premiere of one of these episodes. Imagine you've already seen the first episode, Introducing Asteroids and the th Threat, and that it may or may not have introduced a background theme of what if dinosaurs had a space program. If you're viewing pleasure, here's the second episode. Now I may have to fiddle around with the audio uh, some. If nothing else, I guess I can point the microphone at this. We'll see. It'll be exciting. The first step to preventing asteroid impact is to find the dangerous asteroids. We have to know what's out there. We've found nearly 20,000 near-Earth asteroids, but they're predicted to be as many as a million that could cause damage if they hit the Earth. So, how do we find them? Well, ground and space telescopes watch the skies. And they look for objects that move relative to the background stars. It's kind of like T-Rex would have used movement to distinguish prey from trees. An actual asteroid discovery looks something like this. But discovering an asteroid is not enough, which brings us to step two, which I'll talk about in our next video. <laughs> Remember, asteroid impact is a natural disaster that we can prevent. So be sure to watch the next episodes in our series on the Planetary Society's five-point plan for defending the Earth. Thank you. I want to credit Industrial Light and Magic for our amazing graphic. No, I want to credit Merck Boyan, our amazing video guy at the Planetary Society, who made, made that happen. Uh, I also want to, based upon discussions earlier today, emphasize something about uh, the last point I was making at the tail end there. Uh, we struggle, I think, in the planetary defense community with motivating uh, preparation for such an unlikely event in any given time period. Uh, so one thing that I like to emphasize, and other people do I know as well, is that it's not just that, but it's the fact that this is a large-scale natural disaster that we can actually prevent if we put the work in. And that makes it different than other large-scale natural disasters. All right, so summary, I recommend using a scalable planetary defense public communication strategy using a multi-step organization. Uh, we use an introduction plus a five-step plan. And uh, I put this in here so I remembered, everything we're producing at the Planetary Society is, uh, is we love, would love for people to use. So uh, feel free to use anything we're producing. We'll be producing more materials over the coming time. You can find things at planetary.org slash defense or the random space fact videos at planetary.org slash RSF. And in the interest of claiming the public communication should be succinct, I will finish early. Thank you. Very nice. Uh, questions or comments? One there. So in uh, 2002, uh, Giovanni Malsecchi and myself presented to a meeting of the OECD, of the Science Committee, 
a five-step plan to solve the problem of asteroid impact. And it's similar, but not exactly the same. Our five steps were detect, compute orbit, predict impacts, follow up, and then deflect or mitigate. And the difference is that it's not just a linear thing, but there is a loop from follow up. Once you have found the thing, you go back to computing the orbit, and this is a loop until you get to a probability very close to one, and then you start doing deflection, OK? Uh, I'm, maybe is, yours is as good. But I think there is some need of uh, uh, standardization. <laughs> this uh, particular one has been in use in Europe for 15 years. Uh, in particular, well, actually, the European Space Agency asked us to include the sixth step because they want also to separate f physical follow-up from astro astrometric follow-up. So it, it, it is okay, but it is important to find ways to communicate, and I agree that the step plan is more effective but we, we need uh, to coordinate a little bit of, even in an international way, uh, this kind of schemes in such a way that people don't listen to many different stories. You know, if you, in today's world, if uh, you make one particular material, maybe this is transmitted in TV, and then American TV gets uh, received in Europe and vice versa, and uh, if we appear to give conflicting indication, this is not going to look good. Uh, certainly, ideally, we would uh, have everyone putting out the same information. But with so many groups and so many countries, it's hard to coordinate that. And I wasn't claiming to um, do that. Uh, also, I'd say the steps we came up with, we thought were, were targeted more towards conveying it in a public sense. Um, and obviously, yours are at some to some extent as well. Well, if I can take the privilege of being here, I would tend to disagree, uh, because I think the communication actually depends who you talk to. And when you talk to people, if you go in six or seven steps, you have lost them. Uh, because if you go into characterization, I mean, it's terms that people don't understand. So I would tend to think that I would personally prefer three steps. Because uh, it needs to be short on the media and the public, and they get lost. Uh, so, depend, so I think it depends on the audience, personally. And when you have this type of uh, uh, sim simple messages, they need to keep it to, to, to be simple, at least for mm -hmm. the public. Then for politicians or for decision makers, it's completely different. So I think somehow should be, my personal opinion, should be adapted to, to the audience. But OK. Any? Yeah, yeah, that's, of, of course, the official one. Daniel. Well, uh, uh, I wanted to, to ask a question that was uh, connected to the, to the comment of Andrea. And I would, uh, maybe the, the number of uh, steps uh, should be limited, I agree, but I agree with uh, Andrea that uh, we should have a, a clear message. In, if in this community, when we are asked to communicate with different people, we use different uh, terminology or different uh, way of understanding, uh, it might be not that very clear. And my question was, in fact, related to that. You, in your fourth step, you say deflect. Should we say mitigate? Uh, or is it uh, only deflection? Uh, it can also be a resilient uh, approach. So even on the vocabulary, if we start having a very different uh, approach, because the single word can have uh, different meanings. And to, for that reason, I, I would agree with Andrea that uh, we should have at least most possible uh, uh, common uh, vocabulary or common uh, comprehension of the, the communication you want to make? I mean, it would certainly be ideal. Um, part of the challenge, I think, is at least um, with the English versions of the word, mitigation tends to not be clear what you're talking about. Disruption is kind of clear. Deflection seemed the clearest. That's why we picked it as a point, but then would fill in with information with various options. But all of these are valid points. I mean, you could, you could carve it up in various ways. Thank you, Bruce. I have a very small question, very simple. Uh, if you want to communicate with public all over the world, you choose English, but will you translate all your 
materials all your movies or not because I can't find it in your website. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we actually did translation um, of the YouTube videos, the Random Space Fact, for quite a while using volunteers uh, in several different languages and they weren't getting that much use, so for the moment we stopped, but yeah, we would like to, and I think it's a matter of figuring out um, the best ways to do that. So our first priority was coming up with it in, you know, our, the na our native language, but we definitely, Planetary Site is an international organization with members in over 120 countries, so we certainly, when possible, want to put things out uh, in, all in various languages, it's just a challenge of resources. All right, thanks a lot, Bruce. Thanks. <clears throat> so the next talk is uh, a knowledge framework for smart discovery of planetary defense resources. It's uh, presented by uh, Mira Bambakus, who's from NASA Goddard, is a project manager on the joint NASA and NSA SA DOE National Labs on Neo Mitigation. And the talk is uh, co-presented with Professor Phil Young from the George Manson University, Director of the Special Temporal Innovation Center. Thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon. And thank you all for still being here. Um, I'd like to first start out by acknowledging all of my team members who have served as domain experts and co consultants all along the way in developing our framework and gateway. Our agenda, um, I'm not going to go into too much background because we certainly have covered that um, throughout the week. Uh, we'll look at our architecture, our computing infrastructure, and our knowledge base development for our gateway system. And then we'll tell you where we're, we would like to be heading in the future. Okay, um, planetary defense, I don't need to tell this community how complicated it is. Um, the five uh, basic areas that we're covering and of course, um, the PDCO, um, Lindley Johnson and uh, Kelly, this work all falls under um, their purview. Okay, the motivation for the information gateway. Um, when we proposed this effort, um, we immediately thought we need a framework for the case studies that we're doing for NEO mitigation. Um, and that there is so mu much um, dispersion of all of the information and all of the research res results within our, not only our team, but all the relevant uh, research results um, throughout the community at large. So we need an overall architecture to facilitate our collaborations, a cyber infrastructure to capture all of the uh, mitigation trades um, and mission design concepts. But it's really all about a seamless access um, to a smart knowledge um, gateway to help um, our uh, expert team members um, when they're working on the NEA mitigation um, case studies, scenarios, and um, mitigation techniques. So why another uh, search discovery engine? There's a lot of those out there, of course, and um, we're all very familiar with Google. And we've heard about some others um, that are, are great as well. Um, we definitely, our team needs um, a PD-specific gateway. Um, so our framework is all about planetary defense-related um, information um, and our domain um, is really uh, focusing on all of the expert uh, information and research results. Um, our project team members um, had this easy access as well as others that it extends to um, in the long run. Uh, it's all structured by uh, the efforts that we're working on, design reference asteroids, NEO modeling, uh, and decision support and mission design. Um, those efforts are placed on top of a uh, hybrid cloud computing infrastructure, and then the big data and analytics and simulations are applied. Um, several senior members of our team have uh, suggested that this be extended to the larger, broader community um, for uh, overall um, 
help uh, with seamless access to, to not only our information, but to be able to share and collaborate uh, with the broader community. Um, our effort is not focusing on that, um, but our, our infrastructure and our architecture really is uh, a flexible one, and it's an extensible one, so it is something that is um, uh, possible. Also, um, there are a lot of other portals that I've um, you know, heard about even here this week, and also web pages, and we are in no way trying to um, mess with any of that. In fact, what we're trying to do is connect and link for the greater good. Well, thank you, Myra, for setting up the architectural framework uh, stage. In fact, this echoes the comments we had from the last session about five stages of uh, understanding of the planetary defense uh, uh, process. So we took from there and observing the information flow of each of those five aspects and then put them on top of a big data infrastructure, as Myra said, so that we can have better supporting of this uh, process. So this is supported by several aspects we developed in the past capabilities, including the computing infrastructure and big data ingesting and the data archiving access analytics and scenario building so that we could have better supporting information for decision making and for better research and publication and design and uh, assessment. And I will report several internal results, including five aspects. One is on the computing side. A lot of part is how do we ingest data into the system, uh, including, for example, remote sensing, publication, earth observation. I'm going to focus on the internet part, how we ingest in the web pages into here, and also how to build the PD knowledge base, and then how to access and utilize them for ranking searching results, for example. Uh, there's a lot of information, and I'm going to touch on a lot of machine learning uh, complex algorithms. I don't have time to go through. I have about six minutes to go through about 21 slides. So I will zip through them, uh, but hopefully you get the idea. So we have uh, a, about 500 computing cluster to help us a local hybrid cloud infrastructure. That was blended to the national level of big data cloud. We also have a global level computing infrastructure to support us doing the PD research. And so this is a computing side available for us to do the research. Another part is how do we build the knowledge base and uh, we utilize the knowledge base. So what we have is that the documents, access logs, those are the information we archive here. We also crawl the internet to get the web pages, especially those ones with the PDs, put them in here. And then we use machine learning, natural language processing, and deep learning algorithms to extract and build the knowledge base, utilizing that for ranking recommendation and semantic reasoning here. So how do we build the large base? We first work with our project team scientists, experts, to come up with about 130 concepts. We also go out to the PD pages, PD documents, to extract the keywords, and go through a filtering process to get about 228 terminologies and in combination with those 130, and remove the duplications. We get about 330 core concepts here. And then we add the weights and linkage to PD-related knowledge here using different machine learning techniques here. And this is a sample of those keywords. And so based on this, we build the knowledge base for the PD process. This is the initial stage. And this is all being put into this uh, gateway. It's linked to here. You can have access to that. Uh, this gate, we also have the capability of archiving documents. For example, we can upload and organizing those documents and understanding those documents based on natural language processing capabilities. The fourth capability I want to report is the web crawler, which basically is to collect the web page that's related to PD from the internet. So what we do is that we get the states link, go to the linked pages and go to the following linked pages. By collecting back those pages and using the ontology and knowledge base to do the relevance calculation, if the score is high enough, we're going to put them into the PD database. If not, we're going to discard them. But this process helps us to keep uh, the PD pages and find out those information. So the core here is really this, calculate the relevance score. And this is based on machine learning and other uh, techniques. But these are the factors we have been considering here. Uh, I will not go into details of this. 
But basically, this is the algorithms for calculating the Riemann uh, scores. We also go out to recrawl those pages that may be updated. So there are some strategies been taken for doing this to make sure that all the pages we get are up to date. To piece all those large together, here's the. Oh. So what we do is that we start with the six list of URLs. For example, now we're adding one to the existing four we already have here, and. Out of these four, we can configure about tens of parameters. And this is very technical. We don't have to understand or doing this part as a scientist. Uh, what we really need to look at is we gave the crawler name. This is a session. And what is the state's list we're going to use? And how many rounds we're going to crawl the internet? So once we have that, we can set that the machine to crawl the internet, and they will go out to fetch the word pages coming back to the randomness calculation. If it is PD related, we're going to keep them. If not, we're going to discard them. So these are all running in the background. Uh, we're going to be able to see that, but in order to understand this, we, we bring it up. So after the crawling results, we get to the pages. So these are the PD related ones, and some metadata of that and some statistics after the cloning results. Uh, for example, here we get about what is the cloning speed at different times, and how many different languages we have from different countries, culture, and how many pages we found in total from about 200 rounds of cloning the internet. And what are the domains related to PD pages? And what is the file type? Are they Word pages? Are they Word document? Are they PPT or PDF? And with about 200 rounds of crawling, we have a hit rate of about 71%, which is pretty good. Uh, the reason we use this is the crawling process is optimized using machine learning techniques and also the seeds URL uh, matters a lot here. So the last capability, uh, the internal results I want to report is about search ranking which basically is that if I want to search for some information, we would be able to put the most relevant results to the top. What we do here is that two steps. One is that we're going to understand what we really mean with the search instead of just using the words. Another part is that once we found the pages related to that, what we really want to find, we rank the results using the machine learning techniques. So these are the details how we understand the query and how we do the ranking. This is the page, page ranking, uh, originally invented by Google. Uh, this is also machine learning related. I will not explain the details. If you're interested, we can talk about the details. And you also use the RDA top mod, topic modeling uh, technique to rank and categorize. For example, if we have five, five categories according to the information workflow, the five steps from near Earth observation to decision support uh, to action. So how each page will be related to each of those. So for example, after the, this meeting, we can go back. OK, I'm researching on the um, mitigation part. So which, pa which paper are related to that? So we can do the categorization based on this kind of techniques. And this is the demo about how we do the ranking. Uh, this is supported by the knowledge base with the reasoning behind this. So we can search, for example, new asteroids, and we can find the results, and the results are ranked. So it's almost for sure that the first ones that you see here are related to what we want to find. And if you scroll down, probably we need to improve uh, those parts. So which is, means the ranking is working here. So now I'm going to turn back to Mara. Up. I just want to um, summarize and uh, let you all know that the Gateway um, is here to benefit the PD community um, by providing this seamless access um, to smart uh, information and expert opinions um, and strengthen the linkage between the other portals and web pages. Uh, the next step are to continue to evolve the knowledge base and continue to uh, mature the reasoning model um, and to leverage 
um, already existing 4D visualization for the neo-mitigation um, case studies and, and option techniques, um, and also to collaborate, most importantly, with all of you. Um, so comments and feedback um, we appreciate. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions or comments? Here. Um, so I was just, it, it's like you're using the same classification algorithm that Google's using and I was just curious like why would we not just search like in Google and use your database instead? That's a very good question. In fact, uh, the classification we're using is based on the PD knowledge base we have, and Google doesn't have that behind this. That's, that's the things that make a difference here. Uh, okay. Hmm. Other comments? Questions? No? Then I would well, close Just this. for fun, we have something, uh, a movie which which is ongoing, as Mara said, we want to link the visualization from where do we find the assets to the mitigation stage. Uh, but there's a lot of fragmented visualization results, as we see from here. Of course, we don't have such a big thing in the space, uh, but this is the initial step. And also, we're working, looking into other visualization tools, like this one, developed by Ian, one of my students is collaborating with uh, him and trying to utilize for, for our purpose here. So these are just some examples for fun for, for us. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, it turns out you know, we mentioned yesterday that we would not have an injected day. Turns out that was false news. <laughs> fake news. Fake news. Fake news. There we go. And so uh, it turns out that uh, if you if you let uh, Paul uh, stay awake too long, we got trouble. So um, in in any event, uh, I think he has something to tell us. Did you want to say something? Yes, I. I know we all want to get to the banquet, so I will be very quick. So um, I have. I have uh, to switch slides, right? Let me switch. Good luck. Good luck. Tell me how to end slideshow. Okay. And excuse me, I just have a few slides. Where are they, though? I need ec go to exercise. <laughs> Exercise, yes. And uh, right here. There we are. Okay. I'll put it on. Very good. Just a short presentation. So, this might, maybe this is the longest title of the day, Victoria. I don't know. <clears throat> um, so, inject number four. Uh, we don't have time for discussion tonight. So, what I will do is just talk about and uh, moving the uh, time frame forward three years to June the 15th of 2023, and we'll just pose a problem and you can discuss it over the banquet. That's the idea here. So, so what, what is new is that the Rendezvous spacecraft now have reached asteroid 2017 PDC. The decision makers must deliberate, while eating dinner tonight, <laughs> on the use of the nuclear device, and the kinetic impactors are still en route. So I have just one summary page, um, not too many new facts here, but here they are. One of the two Rendezvous Observer spacecraft has reached the asteroid and has been surveying and characterizing the binary asteroid for a month. But the other, uh, the other Rendezvous Observer spacecraft experienced an unrecoverable reaction wheel failure a year after launch. It's a three-year trip, and its mission was abandoned. Now. You recall that the decision makers put nuclear devices on both of these. So you have two of them to think about, but, they, but there's still time, because the optimal time to deflect, whether it be nuclear or kinetic, is still several months away. Um, of course, the asteroid hasn't changed course. It's still headed for impact near Tokyo, so that's only four years away. Um, and it's still a binary, no change there, 270 meters in size, 90 meters for the secondary. 
The secondary orbit is known a little bit better. It's a three kilometer apoapsis and a one kilometer periapsis, so it's kind of a loose eccentric orbit. The uh, as, uh, same as yesterday, 1.9 grams per cc on the density. The worst case analysis, as we indicated yesterday, if beta equals one, suggests that successful deflection would require all five impactors to divert the primary away from Earth. Now, we haven't gotten these, um, this, or the, the press release or the um, briefing charts up yet, but uh, they will be up as soon as we can um, get them up on the day four page. And uh, a final schedule, this is my last slide, showing you where we are in the timeline. We're at day four here. The rendezvous spacecraft, I've indicated with these arrows, the space missions that we picked. We picked a fast flyby. We talked about that on day three. We picked a rendezvous mission. It's arrived, it's day four. And we have the kinetic impactors, who are, which are still on the way, and they would deflect the asteroid around perihelion, which is about eight months away. So the question for the deliberators, or the decision makers, excuse me, is to decide what to do because you have several methods to deflect this asteroid. Hmm? And its moon, yes, yeah, d deflect both, both bodies of this asteroid. So that's the dilemma, and tomorrow morning we'll discuss that. Uh, we'll, I'll repeat this and we'll discuss that in our discussion. Thank you. That's good. Thanks, Paul. Okay. <laughs> so I think uh, that uh, is it. Uh, at this point, so again, tomorrow morning we'll go into this in more depth, and I think again, one of the things we always do on these conferences uh, is that the, once we f finish with the exercise and all our problems are solved or whatever, um, then uh, we will have a, uh, an opportunity to get your input as to um, what we should carry away from this. And we do, a, do we do final reports on these conferences, so we try to capture your suggestions and so forth and put them in there, and so it's a nice uh, little round robin discussion there. So we'll invite that, and you might think about those things. Okay, uh, Makoto, I believe you had some instructions for us. Okay, so uh, announcement of uh, banquet, very important. And uh, yes. Okay, so information is not changed. Uh, this, uh, this evening from uh, 7.30, uh, the banquet will uh, start. And the uh, place is Grand Nikko Tokyo Daiba. Uh, just a 10 min minute walk from here. I hope the weather is fine. And uh, uh, yes, the banquet room will open after uh, 7 p.m. And uh, uh, maybe after, uh, maybe around 7, 10, uh, drinks will be served. In the bank, uh, in the room. So please come around after 7 p.m. And uh, yes, students uh, who have uh, presentations are uh, invited. So if we, if uh, you, uh, you don't have a banquet ticket, please ask to LOC. Okay. And uh, yes. So the way is very simple. And now you are here, uh, Mirai Kan and uh, the hotel is here, so just walk like this. Okay, and the slight difference is this one. So now uh, we reserved these three tables. Uh, it's okay, okay. So any other table is, uh, you can sit, sit any, uh, any other tables. And the veg vegetarian food is th this one and this one. Okay, okay so please enjoy the uh, banquet. And notice that the floor is B1, that means it's downstairs, yes? Okay, so don't get lost in the hotel, it's a big place. Okay, very nice, any questions or comments? Excellent, we'll see you at the banquet. Thank you very much. <laughs>